Thank you very much for, for joining this session from wherever you are. Uh, my name is Kevin Liu. I represent Scottish Development International in Asia Pacific. Uh, SDI is the Scottish Government's International Trade and Investment Promotion Agency. Uh, and my work is specifically focused on the energy sector. And I'm based at the British office in Taipei, covering the broader region. And I'm delighted to be joined by uh, such an esteemed uh, a group of colleagues and friends to talk about energy opportunities in Asia in a little bit more detail. Now, mindful of time, can I just ask each of you to quickly introduce yourself within a minute um, to talk about uh, what you do, uh, what your business does, um, and we can then move on to the Q&A sessions. So let's start alphabetically with Asman. Thank you, Kevin. My name is Azman, Azman Nasir. I'm the Regional Director for EIC Asia Pacific Energy Industries Council. I'm in charge of uh, helping our members uh, in, in, in Asia uh, uh, to, for market entry and market intelligence. I've been, I've been in this job for about eight years now. Fantastic. Thanks, Azman. Gareth? Yep, so um, thanks for having me, um, Kevin. So I'm Gareth Campbell. I'm the regional manager for the Asia Pac re um, region for Stats Group. Um, I've been with Stats for 10 years and based out uh, from Malaysia for the past six. Um, Stats Group are a, originally a UK company formed out of Aberdeen in oil and gas market, focusing on brownfield and um, pipeline repair and maintenance. So from my position here, it's really a lot of the sales and the operational side of delivering and our products for the region. Thank you. Katie? Hi, my name is Kong Katie, and I'm the director of Elsa Energy. Uh, Elsa Energy mostly focusing on the upstream. Uh, it's an integrated uh, upstream and, and, and a digital solution. Uh, basically, we provide a lot of services covering from the uh, subsurface production, well services, as well as the engineering and the digital solution as well. So it's a wide kind of wide spectrum in the upstream uh, sector. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Katie. Now, Mark. Hi, I'm uh, Mark Skinner. I'm the Managing Director of Scottsbridge uh, Aberdeen and our Singapore operation. Uh, we assist uh, uh, Scottish and UK companies, uh, especially SMEs in the energy sector, looking to develop within the ASEAN region. Brilliant. Thank you, Mark. Uh, now, a message to the audience. We do have some questions prepared, uh, but in order to ma maximize this session for the benefit uh, of the audience, um, we would like to make it as interactive as possible. So please do start sending in your questions, um, preferably, I think, into the chat box. So I can look at uh, one location for, for your questions, but feel free to send in questions at any time. Now, to, to kick us off on the, the, um, the panel uh, session, we've had a very useful uh, overview and forecast of regional opportunities from um, Dr. Madana just now, but I really want to get down to the business end of things and look at where is the money for energy supply chain companies coming into Asia Pacific? And I guess we could focus um, a bit more narrowly on Southeast Asia, given the expertise in the room today. From your uh, point of view, um, whether that's uh, the upstream uh, industries or looking at broader energy transition, where do you see the money being over the next year? And then can I can I kick off with Katie, please? Okay, well, I think it's a very hot topic about energy transition that people put a lot of focus on the renewable. But I think bear in mind that you know, uh, oil and gas still have a very important uh, role to play in the energy mix. Uh, Petronas recently said that um, by 2040, you know, the energy mix of from the oil and gas will just drop from the 52% to 48%. Uh, that means that oil and gas has got a lot of room uh, to play while the renewable definitely will, will go uh, with the up more space as well. So I think in Malaysia, there's a lot of project ongoing at the moment. Uh, you know, you can expect a lot of the drilling activity pick up after the last year, a bit quiet. And there's a lot of uh, activity happening for the well PNA and also the decom as well coming up for, for the many years to come, especially with many aging platforms that's due for decommissioning. So I think uh, overall, Malaysia is still a very exciting place to be, but not forgetting Indonesia, as you probably know that the last couple of years, Indonesia have got a big 
uh, changes happen because of uh, the total uh, have have, uh, have relinquished the whole operation in Mahakam back to Batamina. And by August this year, uh, Chevron, which is producing more than half of Indonesia production, will be returning back the whole asset back to Batamina again. So overnight, Batamina will be from 150,000 barrel oil per day of operation will become maybe very close to what six seven thousand barrel oil per day of operation of, of, of that i think there's a lot of opportunity that uh you know batamina would need support for a lot of big uh, a lot of service provider to keep the operation going right so i think just looking at the same situation in thailand as well where mm -hmm. chamber is also uh, are getting out so pttep has again and uh, inherited a lot of asset coming coming back to them so just look at Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, I can say that there's a lot of opportunity coming up uh, for many years to come. So, yeah. yeah. OK, brilliant. Well, well, we'll come back to that, Indonesia and Thailand. And you also mentioned decommissioning, which is um, of great interest to many people in the room today. And I recognize some of the names of companies that we are supporting in this region. Um, can I move on to you, Gareth, being um, someone who's on the ground and, and in that sales capacity? Mm -hmm. What are you seeing in the moment? Um, what I would say is, I mean, oil and gas—it's not—it's not going to happen overnight. I mean, what do you, what, what, you just see Petronas recently? You know, even <coughs> that they're finding, you're seeing some of the majors, which the likes of your Exxon, who are looking to pull out of Malaysia. So that's going to open up if there's going to be smaller players coming in, which are going to look to find those fields that they wouldn't do so. And um, so I do think there's still a lot of capacity where, don't get me wrong, there's going to be the transition, but there's still a lot which can be done in terms of find the new reserves, how do we get out the ground, how do we get it into the terminals? So it's still a buoyant market for Malaysia, and I see that across the rest of Asia Pack as well. Yes, no, indeed. Um, uh, MPM um, of, of Petronas has obviously now released new guidelines for smaller fields and marginal fields being developed and, and is becoming, I guess, savvier at introducing new opportunities to potential um, smaller or medium-sized medium operators in order to maximise um that um that wealth um so that that's certainly a space to be watched um can i now move on to to you asman uh, and and slowly trying to bring in uh, the topic of energy transition now i think i've explained before that this is a, a bit of a love-hate relationship uh, that i have in terms of the lexicon because i find energy transition quite frankly to be a bit of a woolly term a bit like globalization so i've actually banned the use of it on my team unless you can actually specify what it means. So yeah. what does energy transition mean for you, Asman? And how are you advising your members on how to take on energy transition opportunities? Right, good, good question. I, I tend to agree with you in terms of the energy transition uh, terminology. It's uh, quite, uh, you know, it means different things to different people. Um, what is it, does, what does it really mean? But uh, you see, in, in, in Asia especially, um, it means uh, trying to fit in or trying to comply with the uh, mostly ESG requirements rather than anything else. Um, and not much on the uh, government uh, requirements, more of a, you know, a funders or financial uh, institutions requirements. Because they are looking at compliance, they are looking at uh, declaration, announcements, things like that. For, for companies to actually raise funds. So that, 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 those requirements are becoming more prominent nowadays. But uh, in terms of governments, in terms of a net zero and all that, um, only four or five countries are actually uh, has actually announced, you know, Australia, Japan, Korea, China, uh, and Taiwan. But the rest haven't, haven't really had any push towards uh, climate change. They, yeah, they do have announcements, uh, formal announcements, but they don't really have the incentives or penalties, which like, unlike the Western countries have. So energy transition in that sense, or, or, or move, the move, moving towards uh, non-fossil fuel, is not gonna happen that quick, I think. And so opportunities in, in oil and gas are still plenty. I mean, Madana was showing just now uh, the value of uh, opportunities that we capture in our data, our database, data stream, is about for oil and gas, it's about 1.2 billion, a trillion uh, US dollar. In in renewables, 
we the the, the, the data shows it's about 0 0.9 trillion so still oil and gas uh you know uh, exceeding exceeds the uh, renewables but renewables are catching up pretty fast so give it a few more years could be renewables are there you know uh, uh supersede uh exceeding the uh, oil and gas Devin. thanks asman and if i can pose the same question to you mark um but particularly uh for someone who has um that very good grasp of the scottish supply chain and you obviously have a regional presence in singapore as well how do you see um the supply and demand vis-a-vis -vis, um expertise back in the uk or scotland more specifically versus the demand of asian operators and, de and developers and what are they looking for i think uh, of course with with scotland having such uh, long-term experience and knowledge within the traditional oil and gas sector it's always been a, a, a an area of expertise that's been drawn on and that still continues you know that's still very much at the forefront and within the oil and gas traditional uh, supply chain in in APA region we would still view it that there's still a lot of life you know there's still a lot of activity going to be happening you know, and and I'm sure within the the Madonna's slides, it would have been showing that some of the major projects, this would be some major greenfield oil and gas projects. Yes, a huge focus is going to be on retaining asset, maintaining on brownfield, but there's huge opportunities to be had. So we would still focus uh, on oil, on oil and gas, but at the same time, be mindful of the renewable or the equally i'm confused by energy transition and what that really means um but you know we have transferable skills and most definitely companies should also be looking maybe in parallel with what with their oil and gas aspirations and looking at offshore wind have they got some opportunities in tidal and um, and even maybe in solar because with wind and renewable uh, technologies, there's lots of uh, expertise that could be used, not within the panels, of course, but within the storage of the energy and the whole supply chain. So we would say there's great opportunities available. Brilliant. Well, you mentioned lots of things there, um, including the storage aspect, which is obviously critical. Now, I want to move back to, to oil and gas, um, but drilling down into specific markets. Um, you mentioned Indonesia, Katie, which has obviously had a, a bit of a, a complicated um, history of um, production sharing contracts being slightly misunderstood by foreign investors. Um, and issues around political risk and contract certainty. And it seems like the Indonesian government is trying to do its best um, to present Indonesia as a favorable investment climate, notwithstanding very difficult ownership structures still um, that govern um, oil and gas exploration. But from what you just said um, just now around Pertamina um, producing much more um, in the media outlook, where do you see um, the demand for energy services being specifically in Indonesia? Well, you know, um, Indonesian market has always been uh, interesting and also over the years, you know, there have been, there used to be OPEC country, OPEC uh, members uh, for 1.5 million peaked back in the 90s and dropped all the way down to maybe about 800,000 barrel oil per day now, which is a big, significant drop. I think the governments over the years have been trying very hard to, you know, to transform the policy, to transform the incentive and try to attract the, the, the investment. So, uh, you know, I mean, obviously, with Chevron pulling out uh, and Tota already gone, uh, Pertamina has inherited a massive, massive operation. Uh, you know, talking about the Chevron operation in, in the central Sumatra, you're talking about 5,000 wells of the, you know, of the very heavy oil operation, you know, using the steam flooding and maybe uh, producing more than almost half of the Indonesian, Indonesia uh, production. Uh, it, it's going to be very challenging for Vitamina to, to manage such a massive operation and it opens up a lot of opportunity. Uh, opportunity to not just be providing the services, I believe even to a certain extent to even managing the oil field for them as well. So I expect 
it was going to be get more and more interesting as we move into the end of the year when the uh, Chevron operation is handed over back to Pertamina by August, right? So I personally think that Indonesia will open up a lot of opportunity and uh, and uh, right from the asset management and you know, maintenance and 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 other offshore operation as well. Yeah. So 5,000 wells, lots of pipelines. I'm sure that's music to your years, Gareth, is it not? Definitely. Um, it's just going to start to be um, something that specifically my company we go and target. But um, I mean, that, that's something to touch on in terms of the pipelines and if there's all these wells, you know, when maintenance happens, um, you know, typically a lot of clients will maybe just blow down their gas, you know, they'll, they'll flare it off. And then that's what causes a lot of the old environmental issues, which governments will want to cut down on. Um, there's great technologies out there in the market, like of what Stats can provide, where you simply isolate sections safely, carry out your repair and maintenance, and production maintains. So, I mean, that's part of the ethos of what we look to do as a company. And this was before the, all of the, um, you know, as I said to, to you earlier, Kevin, you know, this year we've seen a lot more of the publicity in the market in around about sustainable businesses. Um, so when, when Stats, you know, we've done this for the past 20 years, and we continue to do so, but it's going to become more prominent as clients, governments, national oil companies, they'll all want to look at how they can bring down these figures on emissions. So um, it, it, I, I think it's definitely, to, to go back to the first question, it's um, it's going to be buoyant in terms of what's going on at the moment. And going forward, I can just see it staying the same, specifically for more technologies that are developed as we go through um, the next 10, 15 years. Brilliant. Um, thank you. Uh, and Mark, you were mentioning before uh, in the backstage uh, that you were working on Indonesia projects and it's a country that you also know well. Um, how do you feel about prospects in Indonesia? Um, I think the prospects for Indonesia um, are going to be immense in the next uh, five to ten years. The challenge, however, is going to be able to, well, would Scottish companies be able to operate? Are they going to be, you know, do they know all the rules uh, in, in relation to how do you operate? You know, that number one is that we find that if a company wants to operate within Indonesia, they, they would have to look at regionalization. You know, it, it's, 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 it's way far away from Scotland as such. And uh, the, the end user clients are going to be looking for commitment. And, uh, and using, you know, Indonesian staff, paying the dues to the government, all of it. So it's a, it's a much bigger picture than just thinking that we will tender a, an RFQ, hopefully we'll win it. Um, that is not really building your business. What you need to consider is the long-term approach for which is going to be one of the, the most active countries in our view in regards all energy types. Okay, so let, let's talk about that because, you know, essentially we're taking quite a pragmatic approach to looking at market entry options. Yeah. Um, we're, we're looking at supporting different Scottish businesses with different business models, risk appetites, um, capital pools, whether they, they're they able to send people out, um, you know, much in the guise of, of Gareth for stats. And if they're not, how do they actually go about winning that business? So if I could just stay with you, Mark, um, and, and obviously, given given the the, uh, the type of work that you do and the services that you provide, what what would you say are some of the the most common market entry approaches that Scottish companies could consider? Well, what we would we we would probably expect of a of a company wanting to move into a new area is they have to do the research and what effect model do they want to have in country. You know that what what's going to fit with them is it by appointment of of agent representation having a, having their own regional office mm -hmm. or even going to a jv you know it may be a case of all of the above apply in the in in the linear uh, approach to the end goal but is is that for indonesia it most definitely has to be um aligning with a similar company uh, where they're adding value, they're adding uh, the expertise and, and, and the training, because let's face it, training is expensive. And, you know, training is key to uh, uh, educating and training the local workforce to be very much showing that they are part of, 
you know, they really wouldn't be working within Indonesia or within Thailand or, or Vietnam, wherever it may be, is that I think uh, the commitment is, 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 is number one for us. Okay, and, and um, on to you, Asman, again, having um, looked at um, the, the, the many case studies, some good, some bad, some great, some not so great, um, what would you um, advise companies on, on their market entry strategies for, for this region? Yeah, I, I, I echo what Mark just said. Uh, to me, number one is being, being in the in country, being present, uh, being visible is the, one of the most important thing. And secondly, is having a, a, a longer term outlook. You can't expect things to happen in the short term. The, there are so many obstacles, so many challenges, especially in a country like Indonesia with all the bureaucratic and changing policies that you, you, will, you will face. And uh, finding a, a, a local partner is you know, a huge challenge. There are so many companies that will want to partner you, but you really need to vet through and talk to people like Mark and, and KT, you know, and every uh, everyone else or ourselves at EIC to actually see whether the, the companies are uh, genuinely good or not. So finding a local partner, and normally in Indonesia, uh, Vietnam, especially, uh, you know, is is, is prob probably a, a more advantageous to partner the SOEs, state-owned enterprise, or the GLCs, government-linked companies, or even the companies subsidiaries related to the, uh, the actual NOCs, like Pertamina Power, Pertamina Renewables, or Petro, Petro, Petro Vietnam PV Power, people like that, companies like that, because uh, then you are dovetailing on them, riding on them, and uh, you get to the, uh, the market quicker. Um, but the other thing is, the re one of the major requirements I think which uh, UK or Scottish companies having trouble with is the, the issue of technology transfer. So this kind of expected already, uh, local content and uh, technology transfer. Uh, or clients like Pertamina and all that kind of want to see what, how are you, going, are, you, are you going to transfer that? Uh, or how, how do you structure it? At least you have it somewhere and you have, you have, you have a plan. Kevin, thanks. Okay, well, technology transfer, massive issue. Let's come back to that. Um, but on, on the subject of local partners, um, Katie, your firm, Elsa Energy, is indeed already a local partner to a couple of Scottish firms. And um, having um, been stalking you on LinkedIn, I also found out that you're an alumnus of Strathclyde, uh, which is great, and, and an additional Scottish connection here. So how have you gone about supporting Scottish players in um, the ASEAN market? Well, first of all, I think you need to really ask yourself, you want a local partner just to be a partner for the sake of, uh, to open the door for you, or you want a partner actually just to have the license to do a business, or you want to go a little bit further, a partner that representing you open the door or even provide the support. So it's the question you have to ask yourself, what level of support do you need and, and, uh, and how committed you want to be? For a big company like people like Stormage, Halliburton, all these big players, they probably will not need to worry. They will open up a big office, probably hire hundred of people, spending hundred of millions. But for a small to medium player, you really need to ask this question, right? So I would say that uh, having a right partner is very important, right? I mean, uh, you can find a lot of companies who want to offer you to be a partner, but there might not be a lot of value added to what you want to achieve, right? So it is very important, like what Asman is saying, really understanding the, the company, their background, the management, and exactly their track record. So that will give you a bit more confidence. Um, so having an agency or going as a partner or even to a JV, to the more serious is even to acquire certain stake in a local company that will give you a more uh, direct access to the market as well. So I think there are many different business models for them to look at, right? So, um, so yeah, you know, it all depends on the segment of the business. It can be a, a downhole, uh, it can be the drilling production, it can be the maintenance, it can be a pipeline. So you just have to do your market research and ask the right question and you know, making sure you choose the right partner. There has been many, many cases people choose the wrong partner and they start with that, and it can be a very bad experience, or even to some extent where the money is not get paid, and also it's many, many problems as well. So 
I, I think we just have to look at it more carefully from case to case. Yeah. Sure. And I guess sometimes it's it's okay to make initial mistakes, right? People yeah. come into the market and they change partnerships, um, they try a few out, and then you know decide on one that that works for them best. And it's part of, um, it's part of going into any business or any foreign market. Um, right. let alone one that is as complicated as the energy industry. Um, I want to circle back to um, technology transfer briefly before um, uh, moving on to looking at decommissioning and energy transition and the kind of the broader renewables. Um, and can I ask you the, um, the technology transfer question, Gareth? Is, is this something that you're concerned about? Um, I wouldn't necessarily say concerned about. I mean, I think there's there's a lot of great stuff out there with my, my own business and others that you're looking at how you can diversify. How can we make sure that what we have can be relevant in the next 10, 20 years when the uses will change? Um, so uh, we're putting a lot of investment into this stuff, which can just make sure that we're actually going to stay prominent. Um, and I do think that that's going to happen around the rest of the industry, be upstream, downstream, midstream. Um, so there's definitely the right appetite there. And I can see that not just my own company, but others are looking to do the same. And, and how do you go about protecting IP? Is, is there a strategy as such? I mean, to, to be honest, I mean, we're, we're a technology company, so we are very, very um, strong in our IP clause. I mean, it's something that we'd never even look to negotiate. So what I would say is it's basically going in with, a, with a, the mindset that this is something that we stand by. And I think that clients realize that. You know, they realize you're putting the R&D, you're putting the money into it. If there's uses they get from it, then it's a bit discussion, but you've got to stand firm on your clauses. Okay, brilliant. That, that's that's very sound advice. Um, okay, now moving back on to, um, to energy transition, I'll probably put decommissioning under this bracket as well, because it is, uh, after all, about decarbonizing oil and gas. Um, we, we've sort of um, described it as a bit of a woolly term and wanting to be a bit more specific about it, but it's also a bit of an um, elephant in the closet. Um, I, I, I used to work in the insurance industry, and it, it sort of feels like what Basel II uh, meant to the insurance industry about a decade ago is something that you never quite understand until it finally hits. So um, from, from your point of view, energy transition is, is obviously a big opportunity and it can mean very many things, but it's after all all about where the money's going to come from um, and what the likes of Petronas or Pertamina, all the other NOCs um, and, and companies are willing to actually invest in. So is it about um, making... Um, oil and gas exploration a bit more energy efficient? Is it about actually a fancy piece of software that helps you calculate uh, carbon emissions and help you trade carbon and, and help you appease your investors, the stock markets or the regulators? What is it actually about? Um, can I, can I uh, give that question to you first, Asman? What is it about? Sorry, you're on mute, Asman. As my new mute. Yep. Yeah, okay. All right. Okay. Got it. <laughs> um, what is it about? Uh, energy transition. Yeah. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, it's uh, energy transition can only succeed, or race to the race to net zero can only succeed, in my opinion, if there's a government push. So at the moment, that's happening with the Western countries, especially UK, uh, uh, Europe, and that's it's not yet happening here in in Asia Pac, especially in ASEAN. Yeah, but uh, obviously politicians make announcements, but uh, in, in the, on the ground, it's just, there's, there's no push. But there's no push, uh, companies don't, don't really focus on it. So the question is, is there any money in, in doing uh, energy transition? My honest answer at the moment, no. Not, 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 not in Asia. Not in, uh, uh, in uh, oil and for, uh, to replace fossil fuel, not yet. Anyway, not in the, not in the short term. But if you are looking at a longer term outlook, again, I, I, I emphasize just now to operate in, in Asia, you must have a longer term outlook because things will change. Things will, will follow the, the way that the Western are doing it. But you have to be there first, you know, be, be the early adapters, uh, people will, will, will uh, you know, follow you, follow your trend. So you, you become a trendsetter, you have to be early. So, yeah. There, that's, that's where the money is. If if you are, you can become the uh, the trendsetter. You are become one of the first. But are you willing to take the longer term outlook? That's the that's the question I always ask uh, British companies. 
at the end of the day. By the way, I'm alumni of University of Glasgow as well, Kitty. <laughs> well, a bit of that uh, cross Glasgow rivalry going on, that's, uh, <laughs> that's always healthy. Um, Mark, would you agree with Asvan's assessment that there is no money at the moment in energy transition? Um, I would agree totally with Asman. I, I would add in that uh, I, I'm unsure of the, the exact attendees that are, 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 are watching at the moment, but I would imagine the, the majority are SMEs. And I think at the, at the early, early adoption stage and at the, you know, trying to hang on to the coattails of what's going on, I think it's going to be difficult for SMEs um, to you know, gain any money from it at the moment. Uh, but I do totally agree. You know, it's the long game. It's definitely going to change. It's it, we, we know it's going to happen. But in the next, it's, it could take a couple of decades until we get into the stage of where there's some serious money to be made. And that's why I think, as I'd mentioned before, the transferable skills element is whatever does come along, if you are already expertise in what you do, and you can trans transfer that technology and or systems or software or wherever to uh you know clean energy yeah that that's a that's a real possibility but i think it's going to be it's difficult for smes um just as um as Asaman had said okay no i i would agree with that um if i could do a bit of um, a plug for sdi and just kind of talk about some of the work that we're doing in, in this area um, we've been supporting Scottish tidal companies with prospects, prospecting for projects in eastern Indonesia um, to try and get some of these remote islands off diesel, expensive diesel generators. Um, been looking at replacing um, temporary, um, mostly diesel generators for remote power stations and replacing those with uh, solar hybrids, looking at hydrogen fuel for ferries. Um, and, and buses in Sarawak uh, and the rest of Borneo. And it's, it's, it's long-term work, right? And it requires a lot of investments and people always talk about bankability um, and even a relatively mature wind market like Vietnam. So people still talk about bankability um, and the fact that insurers find it very difficult to underwrite and bankers find it very difficult to, to finance. So, you know, this is a very long-term game, whereas of course, um, oil and gas offer a very immediate return um, but I guess the, the, the key question here is to what extent might we be able to offer um, kind of readily available solutions such that um, Asian regulators um, and operators will be able to look at these solutions and go, well, actually, this makes sense uh, in our markets. Um, and, and that's largely what SDI is trying to do. So um, going back to the point about Indonesia earlier, it's great to see that the UK and Indonesia have finally launched a trade dialogue with renewables and other clean tech in mind in order to create these long-term partnerships. Um, and you know, hopefully we can get a bit more political commitment into these partnerships in order to make um, uh, export opportunities a bit more apparent and a bit more immediately available to our companies. So there you go, that's a bit of a government plug. And um, that's at least what we're trying to do. Um, um, now, moving on to, to decommissioning, and this is an area that both Gareth and I believe Katie work in. So starting with you, Gareth, we've actually been receiving lots of inquiries on decommissioning uh, in the region. Um, we're actually fielding speakers from, uh, from Petronas and Brunei and Thailand at the upcoming Decom Week uh, in May, uh, hosted by Decom North Sea. Are you seeing those same opportunities on the ground? And you know, I, I, I presume you're working on some of them already. Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, decommissioning is the sort of the word that no one else really wants to, wants to speak about, but it is coming. Um, and I would say in Asia, you know, there's there's old asset here um, and it has to be decommissioned appropriately. There's the regulations coming in whereby whatever the, the, the government start to say, it's got to be done by a certain time frame. Um, that's when I can see a lot of the pressure, which is going to come down on the operators and how they can look to use technologies, like of KT's technologies, which they've got for plug well and abandonment. Um, so I, I definitely think that um, there's, there's a lot of opportunities here. Um, and it's also from decommissioning, also how you can do the conversion. So is there existing assets which can be used for anything going forward, forwards in the energy transition? Um, 
So that's some of the, the interesting papers that we've taken in as a company to see which can be used for current old assets and how they can look to be built upon for the next 10, 20 years. Thanks, Gareth. And would you agree with that, Katie? Well, you know, decommissioning is very new to this part of the world, right? I mean, you look at Europe and America, they've been doing this, you know, for many, many years. But, um, you know, it partly because of the political and the, there's a lack of enforcement on the on the policy. It's only actually getting a little bit of traction uh, after 2015, right? After the oil price collapsed in 2015, when there's a lot of more, I mean, a lot more oil field become non-economical to operate anymore. And that is when the, the more pressure are piling up for Petronas to look at into the decommissioning. I think um, in the region, even Thailand and Indonesia, I think the decommissioning is still a very minimum activities. But moving forward, it's definitely going to be a big shift, right? It's a lot of uh, wells being PA now. There's a lot of platform being planned for decommissioning. And Petronas is even trying to come up with a blueprint about how to manage this decommissioning in a much better way. You know, they used to talk about uh, you know, it's not just simple about cutting the platform, decommissioning, transport the platform, but now you're talking about how to manage the disposal of the platform. And they like the idea about how European is doing it. So uh, apparently I spoke to one of the very high uh, management staff in Petronas. They're talking about how to reuse, reuse the old platform uh, for, a, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of new, small, marginal oil field uh, development coming up. So they're thinking about how can they reuse this old platform uh, rather than uh, build a new one, right? So I think decommissioning definitely will be a big, uh, op uh, big opportunity. Uh, it's from the cutting, uh, lifting, transportation, uh, the cleaning. I think there's no real facility exists in this part of the world how to manage the decontaminants, right? You know, a lot of these platforms are highly contaminated with mercury, and I think they are learning how to manage that. They're probably thinking about how to have a, a centralized uh, yard to manage to do the cleaning. But uh, it is definitely something big. And as we move on, it could be on more and more platform. You're talking about Indonesia, Indonesia, Malaysia. Most of this platform has been operating 30, 40 years. And most of them are due for removal anyway, right? So uh, I, I definitely think that decommissioning is going to be a big opportunity moving forward. Yeah. Yeah, so if it wasn't for COVID, we would have had the OGA in market last year um, talking about the regulatory framework in the UK um, and specifically the roadmap for decommissioning um, and coupled with some of the fine work that the OGTC has been doing on the technology side of that roadmap and how to deliver on these many decommissioning milestones. I think that would be a key part of our thought leadership going forward as well. Um, and, and really just trying to demonstrate how um, it's been done and not just in UK waters, but other international waters um, and how some of these skill sets and technologies are um, readily transferable to that Asian scenario. Um, and I, I would also say and, and encourage those who haven't read um, Petronas's, um, I think it's the kind of sort of three year um, outlook report, which I think it's it's incredible. It's a, it's a really good piece of work. It gives you a lot of detail on the strategy um, and it's a good way to engage um, Petronas um, through um, any of the panelists on today's session and indeed through ourselves um, to really look at what they're looking for. If, if I can stick with you, Katie, because there's a question that just came in from Jason Donovan. I don't think it's that Jason Donovan, but um, uh, great to hear from you. I, I bet you've heard this a thousand times, Jason. Um, and the questions around understanding um, the impact of robotics for um, inspections and maintenance, I take it, um, and the contribution to the energy transition. And I know, Katie, you, um, your business uh, deals a lot with digital services and digital solutions. So I was wondering if you have a view about that. So you're on mute, Katie. Katie, you're on mute. There you go. Are you asking about a question on robotics stuff? On the robotics, yes. Right. So, you know, Petronas, as you mentioned just now, uh, they have an outlook 2021 to 2023 outlook just been released this year. So if you read on that outlook report, it's all very obvious. Petronas emphasize a lot of technology deployment. They, they have put up a lot of uh, emphasis on how to improve efficiency, how to reduce the cost, and mainly focusing on the automation 
uh, robotic deployment, remote operation. So it actually getting a very high up in the priority about uh, what Petronas is going to do about it, right? So any technology that can bring down the cost, that can bring down the efficiency, safety, is definitely a most welcome uh, in, uh, in uh, Petronas particularly. And in fact, we are quite quite honored and proud to be associated with that. Actually, uh, recently we are appointed by Petronas uh, to deploy their robotic uh, technology for all their facilities. So um, definitely robotic automation, digital transformation, data analytics is a big high up on their priority to reduce the cost. Yeah. That's great. Um, yeah. So Jason, after this meeting, um, please connect with Katie to, to talk about robotics. Um, as I my, can, if I can if give I you may, that question. Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah. Kevin, uh, good, you read my mind. Uh, if, if anybody, if any companies with uh, technology, innovation, latest ones especially, and proven track record, please visit the Petronas website and look at Innovation Gateway. You can actually register your company there and there is a one-stop center within Petronas, headed by a young man uh, called Fadlan, who is very energetic and uh, is willing, uh, very friendly, who wants to talk to any company that has technology. Because they have something like 17 pain points within their operations, which they want to solve. And they're looking, uh, they're looking to find technology companies uh, all over the world for that, for that for, to solve those pain points, like what uh, Katie has just mentioned. That's all, Kevin. Yeah, no, I, I, I would I would second that. Um, the, innov the innovation gateway is sort of a bit like what the OGTC is doing um, in the UK. They have calls for, for proposals. Um, they're very specific uh, calls, I think, looking for very specific technologies. Um, we've had Fadlan on a, a couple of webinars before explaining how um, the platform works to Scottish companies and indeed a few have already bid um, and submitted proposals uh, and it's working very well so I would certainly encourage uh, more people to make use uh, of that. Um, any views on robotics Mark? Um, I would have to echo ex everything that uh, Katie has mentioned is, is that that's what we're hearing all the time you know that, that's the, the, the theme is very much in, in AI and robotics and the efficiencies, digitalization, you know, we're hearing it. We're hearing a lot from Thailand, actually, you know, and Thailand is, is viewed, you know, multi, multi sectors and, uh, and the digitalization and the AI, it's big focus on the smart city movement. Um, but in regards to energy, yes, I mean, the, if you have, non me too technology within that sector you definitely have an audience you know we, i mean we we identify that audience for our clients but definitely there is a is a, a a keen ear for for that type of service uh, that probably is in, in the top three we would say at the moment that's great to hear and and for um an ip rich company such as yourself gareth um i presume this is um this is a great business for you. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely the future. I mean, it's something that we're looking at. How can we digitalize ourselves going forward? Because um, you can see a lot of the conventional technologies of the past 20 years, and they're now looking to change into what clients are requesting. Um, and you can see that through a lot of the major issues, likes of your GEs, um, Schlumberger's, everyone is going down that path. Um, so I think it's going to be the future of the business, which you can see that's um, quite prominent with new products that are being released to market. Um, so definitely, as you say, for, for technology companies, it's, it's definitely something you need to be involved with. No, that's great. Um, we're now moving into the final kind of six, seven minutes or so. Please feel free to put your questions into either the Q&A box or the chat box. Um, if I can move on to the final section of uh, this session, which is um, I'm really keen to understand a bit more about the broader ASEAN markets. Um, Myanmar is obviously going through a really tough time at the moment. So that's, let's kind of put that aside. But um, there are other equally interesting, you know, sort of frontier like markets, Cambodia, for instance, um, uh, coming uh, more to the attention of international investors. Um, uh, Vietnam, there's a lot going on still with, when it comes to gas, but also offshore wind. Um, the Philippines, 
uh, is looking at venturing into wind as well as gas exploration, particularly in the south now. Um, there's some of the terrorism troubles are over in Mindanao. Where do you see these frontier markets or emerging markets within the ASEAN bloc? Um, and, and, and where do you see those opportunities being? Gareth? Um, I mean, for, for what we do, um, we're probably looking at within the closer Southeast Asian. Um, but there's definitely, you know, for, for brownfield, wherever there's, there's, there's oil and gas that's being um, transported, and um, the likes of Philippines, there's big projects up there which are going, and you, you'll see that with some of the big um, EPC scopes which are going live. There, some of them are being fabricated up there. There's been a lot of engineering which is happening basically because of what resources that they've got. Um, so I would definitely say the Philippines is one to look at. Vietnam, I mean, I would say it's, it's already a, a buoy market. Um, if you've got good technologies that are there to offer, I mean, like Sepet of Vietnam, they, they're, they're very similar to Petronas and they value technology companies. So um, I would definitely say uh, promote Vietnam somewhere that Scottish companies and other companies should look at. How do we do business there and, and what's the best way to do it? Well, that gives us a good segue uh, to Mark, uh, who was in Vietnam sort of this time last year. How, how do you feel about the Vietnamese market, Mark? Um, definitely on uh, from the a size perspective, it's, uh, it's, it's going to be nowhere near what Indonesia is going to be potentially. But I would say in the current here and now is that if co companies are looking at the ASEAN region, Vietnam has to be on their and they're the they're, they're number one or two because there is so much happening at all levels and and the vietnamese and within the, the pv companies they're very receptive and um, to uh to listening you know that they are very interested in how things can be done better but they're also very interested in of, of a track record no one wants to be the guinea pig so I think if you can uh, uh, give good examples of where that technology has been used globally or within the greater Southeast Asia, you know they're going to they're going to listen. It's 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 the the trick is how do you get them to listen? Um, but that's another story. But I would suggest that has to be Vietnam for us is number one. And Asman never has a problem with being listened to. So Asman, how do you get people to listen? <laughs> Interesting, uh, Kevin. Uh, <laughs> Philippines is, you know, coming up very fast. If you if you notice, last few years, Philippines was never on the map. Suddenly, early this year or during the COVID time, Philippines just surfaced, you know, and then suddenly became uh, beginning to be like following the big boys in terms of the wind and the, the, the geothermals and other stuff. And I would, if, if I had to advise anybody, uh, Scottish companies or not, I would say that the, the engineering part of it, the EPCs, the engineering scope, that is the most crucial factor, which uh, uh, companies and operators and uh, you know EPC companies here are still looking uh, for help in terms of reducing their costs. You know. Call it whatever, oil and gas, uh, re renewables, or hydro, whatever. At the end of the day, it's about reducing the cost and how to do these things. This, and the projects are getting bigger and larger all the time. How to make sure that the costs are not, you know, are, don't overrun. So where this way, this is where the engineering companies, UK, British companies, can actually contribute a lot in terms of uh, the skills and uh, all, you know all the methods, electro technology. No, absolutely. I mean, by our last count um, in, in Scotland alone, 600 subsea engineering companies um, with very specialists, um, mm. products and services um, ready to be offered to the world. Um, Katie, finally on to you. Sorry, Katie, you're on mute again. Okay, for the frontier countries like Laos, uh, Cambodia, so even to some extent of uh, Myanmar or Philippines, I think um, they are the oil and gas is very minimum for those countries. Even for Myanmar, it was a it was a gold rush in the earlier 2010s, where so many so many companies are trying to rush into uh, Burma. Not I mean believing there's going to be a lot of potential. It turned out to be it's not the case, right? So the 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 hydrocarbon deposit in 
Burma is quite it's quite minimum as well. So I think for all these countries like Philippines, uh, Laos, Cambodia, or some slight extent Vietnam, I think the renewable will play a very important role. Uh, this is for for uh, the renewable sector, uh, or even to as Ban just mentioned about EPCC side, right? So I think EPCC for the renewable, you know, it will be a still a big thing. Even Vietnam are doing a big scale of the uh, the wind farm. Um, so to that extent as well, geothermal is very big in Philippines. So uh, I, I I would say that's a that's how you can enter the market for the APCC parts, right? But uh, I'd like to add on about the energy transitioning uh, topic we talk about in Malaysia. So I think there's a few areas we talk about. Right? One is the renewable, right? Renewable means solar, wind farm, all this stuff. And the other one is a gas. So when we are talking about moving from the traditional oil and get crude oil to the new renewable, we actually have a lot of opportunity to open up. Uh, one thing for sure in Malaysia and Indonesia, we we are very much focused on a solar. Uh, there are not much of wind farm because of, there's not much wind in this part of the world. And so the solar is play a lot of important roles. If you are into the solar business, <coughs> it's opportunity to in Malaysia and Indonesia. But the gas is getting a lot of attention now, right? I mean, uh, just before a few years ago, the gas is, was not a big thing. And the oil, I mean, because the gas price was so cheap, even Petronas abandoned the project in Canada. But over the last couple of years, because of the commitment of zero emission, uh, you know, the low carbon, and more and more energy are moving from oil to gas. So actually gas is getting a lot of attention moving forward. So, uh, you know, and as far as uh, gas exploration, gas production, gas transportation, it's going to be a big thing as well over the next 10 to 20 years. Yeah? So energy transition is an interesting word, depending on how you look at it, right? Uh, you know, it will not take away the oil and gas industry for sure, but it will open up a lot of opportunity for uh, gas segment as well as the, the solar in this part of the world. Yeah. Well, I think that's a really nice way to help us end, Katie, because gas, I think, for me, encapsulates the word transition and what that actually means is a step change in carbon um, reduction um, towards, uh, obviously, uh, more uh, cleaner forms of energy in the future. But so that's that's very well said. Um, so with that, I would like to, to, to close uh, the panel session. Um, thank you so much again to my uh, panelists uh, for, for your time and for your wisdom and insight. Thank you all to the audience. Uh, and I hope you got something useful out of it. I certainly did. Um, can I now redirect you to um, the next part of um, this event, which is the networking aspect. Um, so if you were to click on networking on the left-hand side of your navigation plane, you will be then able to set up one-to-one -one meetings with uh, fellow participants of this event. Um, so I'll, I'll close the session here. Thank you very much once again to the panelists and the audience. Uh, we'll see you another time. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm.